Well, Merry Christmas. How are you? Oh, good. I'm glad. As I have been uh, sharing through the Christmas season, really beginning with the teas when uh, Mary Ellen was speaking to the ladies, we have been uh, talking about the people and the places that we've all heard of before if we've been alive long enough to go to Sunday school and listen to the Christmas story. And so I kind of drug out my favorites this year, all of which I've talked on before, um, always looking for that freshness that comes because the Word of God is alive and powerful and will always say something new to you. I, I don't care how many times you've heard a text. Uh, we're talking about something alive. So sometimes people cheat themselves because they think, oh, I've, I've been to so many of these Christmas things. There isn't anything they're going to tell me that I don't know, except you may have looked in the mirror this morning and noticed you're not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and if that's the case, there is always something to trigger the heart and trigger the imagination. In Matthew 2, verses 1 through 2, we talk about some of the real unusual guys that are part of this story. And it goes like this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, now all that we've been dealing with was leading up to the event and the event itself and the the, uh, the angels and the shepherds and uh, we had a sermon about Chimham's Inn which is a long Old Testament history of the inn that Joseph and Mary tried to get into. That was an interesting study. If you missed it, you might want to try to get hold of it. And uh, after he's born in the days of Herod the king, and Matthew wants us to know this, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now there's that pesky star again. Now it has been speculated upon on so many occasions. I mean, you've got this thing, you know, made into so many different forms from meteors to fireworks to, you know, to you name it. But there's one thing I'm very sure of, irregardless of whether it was natural, supernatural, or a mass delusion, it was supernatural. All right? And so here it is again, and it has been moving again. And these guys from the East are important men. Now, they're from a long way away from the area of Babylon, which is today's Iran and Iraq. That, I find that very interesting because they too were at a time uh, great enemies of Israel. Babylon took them captivity for 70 years. He destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and uh, a pretty large portion of the Old Testament deals with this uh, rebuilding issue of Nehemiah, Ezra, um, Esther's story is, is there. And this, uh, this is an interesting group of people to be coming to Jerusalem to visit the king. Now, all of this took place hundreds of years ago. In other words, Babylon was long gone by the time these wise men showed up. But you have to ask the question, 
who were they and how did they know, how did they have enough faith to follow the star? Now, one thing you need to know is that these weren't the three amigos. In fact, the Bible nowhere tells us there was three of them. Uh, this is drawn from the fact that there were three gifts. But that doesn't mean there was just three guys. If they were important men of the court of their respective countries, and I believe they came from those regions, there's, there's the possibility that they were not only all from Babylon, but they might have run into each other in the desert, all based on knowing some of the same things, uh, or maybe it was an organized trip uh, all out of the region of Babylon. But that's a pretty large area that we're talking about. So these men and very large entourage would have been with them. You know, l large groups of people, entourages that were there to protect the gold. You don't walk around by yourself with all of these goods. Hello? Ask anybody that's ever worked for Wells Fargo in the 1800s and they'll tell you. You don't load up the stagecoach without a guy with a shotgun sitting up top, you know, with the driver. And so these, uh, this entourage, this group of, of guards and important people, I mean, think of the, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. What did he have? He was an important dignitary, and he had an entourage that had to be contended with. So they're probably descendants, either in group or somehow separately, descendants of Nebuchadnezzar's courts. Remember him? He was the guy that was the center of the story of their captivity. And if you remember that, you will be familiar with the life of Daniel and the book of Daniel. Now, if you feel like doing any of this homework, you're probably more than a casual student of the Bible. But it's all connected, as we've proven time and time again. So you had the commentary of Daniel, which was lengthy. You had the commentary of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah, Hosea, Zechariah, Malachi, and they all foretold the coming of a great king. And the wise men, during their lives and during their studies, during their times together or apart, whatever, they, they were familiar with the scriptures. Now, where do you suppose they got copies of the scriptures? They took Israel captive for 70 years. They had their own gilded copies. So anything written or read in Jerusalem would be read in Babylon. And now would have been several hundred years. It would have, uh, the, uh, the, these writings would have lost their stigma of being written by the Jews. And so these men had all heard the word of all of these prophets and at the very least went, hmm. What do you guys think about this? Well, we think it's pretty heavy. We, 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 think it, we think it probably deserves our expectation. And of course, when the star shows up, they're texting each other like crazy. <laughs> you know, did you see the star? Did you see the star? What, what do we do? Well, let's go. Now, there also is the fact that there were a lot of Jews that decided to stay in captivity because they were, many of them, uh, especially after the release of the Jews, to go back and rebuild uh, the wall and rebuild the temple and rebuild Jerusalem. Many of them decided to stay because they were given simply more freedoms as a people and so you have the story of Esther, which is another Bible study. 
you know, to look at that takes place in the context of these people. And so there were interpreters, uh, you know, alive and, and well, other Jews running around, able to answer questions of people. There was a, what, what, what does this stuff mean? Now, we flash forward to Herod. Herod was a puppet king under Rome. He ran uh, Israel, but simply as a political king. He was not a spiritual man at all. He just ran the region to keep it in order. And people like Pontius Pilate, at the point of Jesus' crucifixion, were, were the, the order was the same. The players were different, but the structure was the same. And Pontius Pilate would have been a governor under the king. And so we have a Herod and then a number of Herods. And this particular Herod heard about it, and he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Now, he's just your average Joe heathen, Herod. He doesn't know anything. You think he spends any time with a big scroll of Isaiah looking, you know, checking it out? So he goes to his, to, to his captives, in effect, the Jews. He goes to the scribes and the chief priests and says, what, could you explain this to me? Why are these guys coming here? Where is this Christ, this ruler of the world, where is um, he supposed to be born? And so they explained it to him in some significant detail. In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now Herod was the king of Israel. That was his job. He didn't have job security based on this verse. His job security is threatened. And he's not happy about it. And he asked these scribes and chief priests, and they just said, well, five miles down the road from where we stand right now, he's supposed to be born. And Herod goes, that's not good news. You sure it's not any further? You're, you're sure you're not missing the mark? No, Bethlehem kind of means Bethlehem. And... And uh, we can't change that. You asked, and, and, and here it is. Now, what I find interesting in this banter between Herod and uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees is they are all discussing accurate knowledge, right? Everything they're saying is right. The scripture is right. The prophecy is correct. The prophecy has been fulfilled. Jesus has been born. They got all the right information, but no interpretation. Now, I hate to state the obvious, but isn't that the truth today? Knowledge without faith is a very dangerous thing, and we call ourselves a Christian nation. Oh, yes, we're a Christian nation. We have all kinds of knowledge. We know plenty. There are some of you that are very versed in the Scripture. You're versed in this Scripture. And so here you have this little conversation going on, and to me there's so much irony in it that it's, it's kind of hard to believe. They're discussing the accuracy of an Old Testament prophecy that has been fulfilled, and now people are acting on the fulfillment of this prophecy, but for Herod, it's bad news. 
Now you've heard me say, if you've been around here 10 minutes, sin makes you stupid. I can't imagine a more mindless, foolish, empty conversation than what these men were having at this point. An absolute, meaningless conversation about something that is the absolute truth and has already been fulfilled. We started this with after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And so it's like, oh, well, how do we stop this? Too late, Herod. Well, how do we, how do we turn back the hands of time? I don't know. Go listen to Cher. Sing it. <laughs> you, you, you can't stop this. It, 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 it's already happened. Yes, but it's a threat. To, too bad. You're just getting around to figure it out because your scribes and Pharisees are as stupid as you. Maybe worse. Because they know this in detail and have refused to act upon it. As a matter of fact, why weren't Israel's wise men looking toward Bethlehem? Why weren't, why weren't their wise guys looking down the hill? Knowledge without faith is a dangerous thing. Proximity without faith is a dangerous thing. You know, being near a church or driving by a church that preaches the gospel to me is like someone dying of starvation outside of a restaurant. I didn't know there was food in there. It's, it's pretty stupid for being dead. Really? Spiritually dead because it was right in front of you. Why weren't they looking toward Bethlehem? Why weren't they interested in the star? All they had to do is walk outside and go, whoa, what's that? Don't know. Let's go back to watching reruns. But that was the case. That was the setup for the three wise men. And Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Not only was he delude, deluded, He's a uh, liar as well. Complete deception. Deception is an amazing thing. Spiritual blindness is an amazing thing. It still confounds me that deluded people can simply not have their minds changed when the facts are in front of them. But you know, faith and facts... They're two totally different things. You know, I've been preaching the gospel for a long, long time, and I have found that this is uh, a dynamic that takes place over and over and over again. Facts never saved anybody. Winning an argument never saved anybody. When the Lord is drawing someone to himself, you become a fount of wisdom. When the Holy Spirit is not drawing them, you just become a threat. You're just one of those religious right people. And uh, try not to enter into arguments this season with people for whom the Holy Spirit is not drawing. And then be really sensitive to the ones that he is. You'll be able to tell You'll recognize the Holy Spirit. You'll recognize the struggle. You'll recognize the intensity 
of what's going on in a person's life. Because, you know, you lead no one to Christ. Did you know that? We need to go lead somebody. No, 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 no. Billy Graham always said, sick the hound of heaven on him. You pray for people to come in the kingdom. You recognize that God is working on them, and you're just a vessel. You're just somebody that has the living water for a thirsty soul. And you learn the difference between those two things, folks, and you'll argue a lot less and evangelize a lot more. And you won't be so worn out at the end of the day. And family gatherings will be a lot nicer. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now there's some speculation as to where the star went or if it disappeared at all, because it, it, it's almost as though it reappeared and that when the wise men showed up, where did they go? Where all the lights were, where the action was. They went to where the temple was. They went to where it was happening. They went to the, the, they went to the place where they might find a king because they were kings, you know. They went to the mall, baby, where it's all happening. But they're not going to find Jesus in all that hubbub. They weren't going to find the Messiah in the middle of all that. And so the star was not going to lead them to the wrong place. I know that's a simple point, but can everybody kind of soak that in? The star is not going to lead them to the wrong place. So there's a whole side sermon on that one, which I won't preach because I know you got other things on your mind tonight, especially you kids. And by the way, you're being so good and attentive. Thank you so much. And so the star is back into the picture. And when they saw the star, they, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy and probably learned a lesson. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. I like these guys. First of all, they're introduced to faith by obeying the word. They saw this in Scripture, and they said, Let's saddle up, guys. Let's go. And then, the next, they're warned in a dream, and, and they're being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. I mean, they get together for breakfast, you know. They look at each other, and how'd you sleep? Oh, man. How about you? Oh, it's terrible. Well, I didn't sleep real well either. Well, what? Why? Well, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. I'm, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what dreams mean. So one of them decides to have the courage to say, you know, I dream that we shouldn't go back to Herod, and that he's a really bad dude. And and the other one, I don't know who the leader was. One of them was, and the second guy, he goes, that's exactly what I dreamt. And the third guy, he's completely off the hook. And goes, me too. Or me three. These were these were God's enemies, descendants. I mean, I'm back to the, the 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 wise men. Do you understand that that centuries before these were 
God's enemies, descendants of bloody, murdering, kidnapping despots, murdering heathens. Do you, do, you, do you realize that? Now, if I had another 20 minutes, there's a lovely rabbit trail about forgiveness and a lovely rabbit trail about generational forgiveness. There was not going to be some Hatfield and McCoy's thing come out of this. Right? They, they're different. But they are descendants from some really bad people. But they were also seekers of the truth. And apparently by any means available. And, and, and what a story of amazing grace and forgiveness. If, if I would begin talking to you about the atrocities committed on the people of Israel and, and the children, it would become very X-rated very fast. They were horrible, horrible enemies. And it was a story of grace because God spoke to them in a language that they understood. Astrology. Because that's what they were. They were astrologists. They watched the stars. Why do you think it was so easy for them to, to pick out this weird one? What's this weird one? I don't know. Have you ever seen anything like it before? No. Well, what do we do? Well, somebody said something about something over in these weird Jewish books. Let's check it out. And they did, and God spoke to them in a language they understood. He loved them so much that he gave him his son and drew them to his son through something that obsessed their interests and their heart. Now, there are so many times that we judge people for being super interested in a sport, in an activity, in some interest that we don't understand at all, and we'll, we'll just judge them. They'll never find Christ there. But you have to understand, he will speak to you in a language that you understand, even if no one else understands it. How many astrologers do you think they were? Do you think they were in that particular time? So it doesn't matter whether you're a child, a man, a woman, a teenager, a rebel, or an atheist. He can get to you. I don't care what you're into. He can get to you. He can get to you. One of the great things that I want to share with you sometime this year is some of the great works that God has done through um, gang uh, leaders, gang members in, in uh, South Central L.A. that I've come to know. Some of the great things that God has done through champion championship surfers and boarders and blah. I mean, I could just go down a list of testimonies of how Christ reached these young people through the very things that they were interested in many times to their parents great relief now the gifts this is where we get the tradition why do we give presents and receive presents on Christmas blame these guys Gold for a king, frankincense for the work of the priest and the ministry, which deserves a much longer explanation than I'm offering tonight. Myrrh was an ointment used as a preservative for those who were about to die. These were the gifts of the wise men, and even at the cradle of Jesus, foretold the true king, the perfect high priest, and in the end, the supreme savior of mankind. Now, I was out at 
one of the malls yesterday. It's the first time I would considered suicide in many years. <laughs> Make it stop. Just kidding. I looked around and I thought, you have got to be kidding. These people are out of their mind. And I realized I was one of them. <laughs> what am I doing here? And we're checking the list and checking it twice. And I don't care who's naughty or nice. Just get me out of here. Yeah. But do you realize the effort that these men expended to bring these gifts? It wasn't a trip to a crowded mall, I'll tell you that right now. It was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles on foot or on horseback. What an effort to establish a tradition for us and just kind of keep that in mind because sometimes the whole thing can become a hassle. And it's hard to keep gift giving in its proper perspective. What an effort to bring a gift. And that brings us to my close. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The ultimate gift of God. And we talk about well, how do you receive Christ? And we got all kinds of, you know, things. Raise a hand, repeat a prayer, come forward, sit down, roll on the floor, stand on your head. We got all kinds of, you know, different man, but but it's all just the mechanics of trying to get you to open the gift. And I, I'm not real critical of, of any of them. I just know it's it's man, you know, our attempt to try to, to, to get people to do business with God. Would you, would you please just open the gift? And at Christmas, it's a lot easier to explain because, you know, I, I, especially you kids, are you going to leave any of your presents unopened till next Christmas? What? No. no. That's the correct answer. You get a point. No one, even the adults. Well, I think I'll save this one. It has a particular rattle to it that I like. I'll use it as a percussion instrument. And I'll put it on the shelf. I like the paper. No one does that. You open the gifts. And so in all the ways that we try to get people to meet with God, whether it's a prayer, whether it's a few minutes at an altar, it all involves you opening the gift given by God to you, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. So we've all gotten kind of familiar with all the gift opening arrangements, you know? Some of you more hard-hearted, chainsaws. Some people with scissors. Knives are dangerous in the hands of yet to be converted. Sometimes bare hands work good. A conversation, a prayer, Whatever, as long as you get the gift open and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So if you don't have that business done with God, it's going to be harder to have a Merry Christmas. You'll have it anyway. You may even have some discussions. You may even have some profoundly truthful discussions that are theological and surround prophecy and its fulfillment just like the conversation between the priests and, 
and inherit, it won't matter till you get around to opening the gift. And that's all for Christmas 2016. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, the opportunity to share the life that you've given us through Jesus Christ and through your ultimate gift. We pray, Lord, that this story, which it's been relegated to, comes alive tonight in our hearts and becomes so much more than just a story. And Lord, uh, I pray, Lord, as we, uh, many of us in leadership would gather after this service down around this platform, that Lord, if there are any that need any help opening that gift, we got the tools to help. And that is an invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, and the whole church said, Amen. Amen.